Calvary family. We pray your blessings upon the angels of this house. That you give mercy to her. Beautiful bride that she's filling up with the well. You visit her. Lord, have her with this sweet. Let her come with us this week. God, we love you. Thank you for this body. Second time the sound booth will get a curveball because I had when I spoke with Brother Andrew earlier this week, my heart was set in Philippians, and not Philippians, in Psalms 15. And as I was sitting there next to, next to him, the Lord said, "No, we're not doing that right now." <laughs> I don't see the joke, <laughs> but one of the things that I love to say that I am is obedient to the spirit. So y'all got to pray for me. Now some of you are looking at me trying to figure out whether or not I can preach. That's all right, because I'm looking at you whether or not you can say amen. And so we need to coincide one with another. But if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Philippians. I see he got it to you. I'm reading from the English standard version. Beginning our reading at verse 12. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen unto the furnace of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are made manifested in all the places and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord are waxing confident by my bonds. I'm much more bold to speak the words without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even on envy and strife and, and some goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention and sincerity supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the others of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and therein do rejoice, yea, and rejoice. I want to talk to you this morning from this thought. Keep your eye on the donut and not the hole. Keep your eye on the donut and not the hole. I've been pastoring now at the Unity Baptist Church for 25 years. A lot of time I find myself talking with people that are going through hard times. But when life somehow seems to tumble in, then I get a phone call in the middle of the night or early in the morning. And when that phone call comes, there are normally two questions. The first
first question is this. Why has this happened to me? The only reasonable answer is to say that what you see depends upon what you're looking at. Often we fail to discover the answer we need because we're looking in the wrong place. But the second question is this. Not only why has this happened to me, but what am I to do now? I recently discovered a good answer to that is, it's a little saying, but it contains a big truth. When hard times come, keep your eyes on the donut and not the hole. Think, think a moment about that statement. A donut has two parts, the fried dough and the whole. You got a choice. Which one attracts your attention? You can focus in on the lack or you can focus in on the donut. Your perspective in times of difficulties makes all the difference. Our text tells us how Paul responds to difficulty, a difficult experience in his own life. We learn from these verses four perspectives on adversity that will help us focus on what we have and not what we like. Are we interested? The first thing is this. Adversity always opens a new door for the gospel. Adversity always opens a new door for the gospel. I want you to know, brothers, that we have, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it is, has become known throughout the whole imperial God and, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. The word advance is a military term. It refers to the movement of the army. And we love singing songs about we are the army of the Lord. Then beloved, it is time for us to move out without delay. And in our moving, the first thing we must do is clear out all the obstacles in our way. When we were doing training in the military, and we've been taught how to clean or to clear houses and making sure that there was no one left, we had to do that room by room. You could not leave one room unturned. My question for you this morning, Calvary, is this. Is there room in your heart that God's not welcoming? He goes room by room. And then once you clean the room, you got to secure the room. Because the enemy is coming back. And if he finds the room empty, guess what? He becomes ten times worse to get out. Just a quick survey. Have you ever gone through something and you never fortified yourself while you were going through, only discovered you got to go back through it again and it's worse than it was the first time you went through it? But to do that search and secure those rooms, room by room, that must be a plan. That must be an avenue of approach. That must be systems that we have in place so that we can fortify ourselves against the enemy. And what happens is that when we don't fortify ourselves, the enemy comes back and destroys the victories that have already been won. So what do we do? What do we need to do? Everything hinges upon our focus. Beloved, that's why it's so important that you keep your eyes on the donut and not the whole. 
Paul is confident that his imprisonment was not a set, setback, but it was an opportunity to advance the gospel in Rome. Think for a moment about the long chains of evidence that led to this moment. It starts in Acts 21 when we when he went to Jerusalem to make an offering in the temple. Unfound rumors spread that he had brought a Gentile into that sacred place of worship. Beloved, I'm so tired of people telling me who, and who can and who cannot worship with me. I'll wait. I ain't got no place to go. I'm so tired of folks looking at folks saying, you can't worship with me. At some point, the advancement of the gospel has to be more important than us. But as long as we have our eyes on the whole rather than the donut, we make, I, I, I got to go. Eh? See, what we must understand, somebody knows more about you than you know about you. If you think I'm lying, ask your neighbor. <laughs> but, but, but Paul, in that 21st chapter of Acts, finds himself in a mob scene where Paul was severely beaten and would have been murdered if the authorities had not stepped in and arrested him. Isn't that a great choice? Eventually, he went to Caesarea to stand trial as a Roman citizen. There he was held without bond, for, without bail for two years. He narrowly avoided being murdered by groups of cutthroats who vowed not to eat or drink until they killed him. Meanwhile, he gave testimony to Felix, the Roman governor, who listened attentively and then kept Paul in confinement, hoping for a bribe. Beloved, isn't it strange that you can talk to folks and they are real attentive to what you have to say until you get to the invitation? And they sound then like King Agrippa. Thou hast almost persuaded me. But beloved, then Paul eventually was put on a boat with other prisoners and sent to Rome. But the boat never made it. Eventually sinking during a violent storm in the Mediterranean Sea, Paul and other survivors was washed on the shore where a serpent came out of the fire and bit him. And finally he was brought in chains to Rome where he was kept under house arrest for two years. We've been pan complaining about the pandemic. I don't know what's the problem. <laughs> Meanwhile, his opponents began to spread rumors about him, attempting to destroy his reputation and ruin his ministry. That's the background of Paul's statement in verse 18. What has happened to me? As he looks back, he sees clearly that everything happened for, the, for a divinely ordained purpose in his life. Even the false rumors, even the riots, even the beating, even the arrest, even the four years of consignment, even the public misunderstanding, the ruining of his reputation, the snake bites, and his house arrest in Rome all had one clear picture. God's plan must go forward. It does not matter what I'm going through. The gospel must be heard. And Rome was precisely the place he needed to be. Rome was not only precisely the place he needed to be, it was the precise time that he needed to be there. 
Can you imagine being on guard duty change to Paul? Eight hours on your day, you couldn't go nowhere. You couldn't take a break. You would just change to Paul. Some of us can't stay in church 30 minutes. <laughs> but all day, every day, change to this lunatic preacher. But Paul saw it as the providential hand of God. Do we really believe in the providential workings of God? As a Christian, Paul had a high view of the providence of God. How about you? That's the belief that God is in charge. I got a little shocking statement I need to tell you this morning, so you probably want to write this down. He is God, and you're not. No, y'all miss me. He's God, and you're not. And whatever you're going through, God, ha God has ordained it for your life. And if I put my mind on the things of God, rather than what I don't have, things may move a little quicker than they are. That's the belief that God is in charge and everything that happens to us, good and bad, positive and negative, and, and in some way, things that we don't even know about are working out to the glory of God. He's ordered all things, including our own free choice of him, so that what happens to us is our good, to, for our good and for his glory. Whether we're healthy, whether we're sick, whether our marriage is in a positive state or a negative state, God will get victory out of our testimony. Beloved, God has put us in a place where we're living at a time where we're in a place where we're living in a time where wrong is not right and right is not wrong. But at some point, the church went in the closet when the foolishness came out of the closet. Some, I, some wrong. But we're complaining about the culture. But we won't stand up and do nothing about it. We're complaining about our lack rather than about what we got. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. We win. But if you got your eyes on the hole rather than the donut, we will always complain about our lack rather than about what we do have. Beloved, it is something else to say that you believe in God's providence when you're in good health. It's something else to say you believe in God's providence when all of your children are fine. Now, I have four children. The youngest, how old is our youngest child? He's 40 something. That, that's his mama. <laughs> so I don't feel bad if I don't know how old he is. <laughs> Neither does his mama. But here's what I want to tell you. We've got eight grandchildren, one great-grand, all of them crazy. <laughs> but don't laugh, so are yours. And let me tell you how I know because they fell off your tree. <laughs> oh, come on, you ain't always been saved. You haven't always been deacons. You were not always in church on Sunday morning. Some of y'all was struggling trying to get in from Saturday night. Okay, I'm the only somebody that drunk moonshine. 
My point is this. God has brought us from somewhere. Does not matter what I'm going through. God has delivered me. Many of the afflictions and the suffering of the righteous. But God has brought us through them all. So whatever I'm going through is not worthy of my attention. The God that brought me through my last struggle, he'll bring me through this one. Beloved, what we must understand is that we have a God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which we may ask or think. Adversity not only opens new doors for the gospel, but adversity encourages us to be bold in our witness. Because of my change, most of the brethren in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the words of God more courageously and fearlessly. Somebody ought to be telling somebody about God because you was bold enough in Brookshire, brothers, to tell them how good God's been. Somebody ought not be ashamed to tell how good God is because you was at the PTA meeting bragging on God. Somebody needs to know that even at storms, God is an awesome God. You ought to be bold enough to say your grace over every morsel of meat that God has fixed for you and somebody will take notice. Courage is contagious. There's some things that we think we can't do. But if the person to the next of us are doing we got 400 boxes. Brother Andrew, here's what I'm going to tell you. When you first said we're going to have 400 boxes, somebody said, no, we're not. <laughs> somebody else said, I know we ain't going to get that many. But it took courage to say, yes, we will. Yes, we will. At some point, Courage has to be contagious. Paul's courage is courageous even though he's in chains and he's shamed to an unbeliever. Um, yeah, let that blow on your mind just for a minute. You get that on your way home. Uh, God put him in chains and changed him to an unbeliever. Somewhere on a rock, write this. You've been changed to your co-worker. You've been changed to the student at school. You've been changed to some unbelievers that you won't even tell the goodness of God. But you know what? There's somebody waiting for you to say something because they'll get, if you say something, they'll say something. If you stand bold, they'll stand bold. God, I would have hated being changed to Paul. <laughs> Can you see them changing God, changing the, the God, <laughs> and the new God coming in? You see, he, he's back at it again. <laughs> he ain't stopped talking about that Jesus. Beloved, the next statement I make, I make without the fear of contradiction. Here it is. And I think there are four things we need to understand. First is this. Paul faced difficulty with joy. How about you? When you're going through, can we see God in your going through? Or do we hear, do we hear the misery of your story? It is God. I was in the hospital, went in the hospital. Actually, I'd gone to the emergency room. The doctor told me, he said, you got COVID. I can't repeat what he told me, but he said, he said, listen, you're going to feel like for the next couple of weeks, but you're going to be all right. You fill in the blank. <laughs> My wife took me home, and I left and went to the laboratory the little boy's room, the necessary room, call it what you want to. 
But in that room, I discovered I could not breathe. I discovered that I could not stand up. She called 911. I got to the hospital, and the doctor said, you got COVID, and you got double pneumonia, and both of your lungs are gone. He put me in the room and put an oxygen. They were giving me oxygen. He put me in the room. About 11.30 that night, a little nurse came in, and she came in to check my vitals or whatever, but I was in the midst of my nightly prayer and some praise. And she stood there. She said to me, she said, I've never seen a man in your condition. Praise God. I was in the hospital 17 days, and for 17 days, even on her day off, she came to be with me in prayer. I let her and three of her co-workers, her co-workers, they are now worshipers to Christ. Doesn't matter what your condition is. God is greater than your difficulty. And you got to be bold enough to say to your situation, you don't weep. You got to have joy when you're going through. Have your child wreck your car. And you walk out to your car and it's like, and you really want to say some parental words that's actually not found in scripture. But then you remember, I got insurance. Whatever the difficulty is, I was in Iraq. I get a phone call. I got breast cancer. I'm in Iraq. She's in Texas. Wife of 20 some odd years, four babies. What you do? It ain't like I can get home in a hurry. But thanks be to God for our past. Because in my absence, he shows up. Beloved, what we've got to understand that no matter what you're going through, you're sitting next to somebody that can help you through. And they can do it with a smile on their face. Joy bells will be ringing. Angels will be singing. But I got to hurry. Andrew, I don't know if you preach this long, so I better hurry up. <laughs> Paul used every opportunity to speak up for Christ. Every opportunity. You got to tell somebody how good God's been to you. Amen. The church can't shut up. We got to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. We got to let folks know that our God is still in control. Amen. If it had not been for Jesus on my side, where would I be? When you find joy in your difficulties and you're willing to speak up, what it demonstrates is a lack of fear. Can I get honest with you? Fifteen years ago, I wouldn't have been in here. Here would have been my response. I'm not coming to preach to them white folks. Y'all don't have to like it. I'm just telling you the truth. But here's the thing. If I had invited you to unity, you wouldn't come because you wouldn't come to church with them black folks. Go and say amen. Because <laughs> reality is the reality. But when we lack, when we don't allow fear to take over us, we are able to stand boldly and declare how good God is. Because here's what I want to tell you. Those 400 boxes are not all going to little white children. They all need the gospel. And so the gospel is bigger than your skin. It, when, when, when you are confident that God is on, God, I don't know why you gave me this, but when you are confident that God is on your side, you lack fear. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I have no complaints. Wife's had cancer, been cancer-free for almost 30 years. 
Y'all don't have to clap. I'm celebrating all by myself. I had a stroke in 2014. I had COVID in 2019, somewhere around. I don't even know when it was, but I had it. But you know what? I ain't going to complain about it. It's just my new norm. I walk a little slower. I got to make more trips to the bathroom. All those things happen. But praise be to God, I'm still here. I'm still here. Here's what the doctors told that girl in 2014. 90% of the people that had a stroke in the brain where he had the stroke never wake up in the morning. And if he wakes up, he will never be able to be understood again. When I got to rehab, here's what I told my speech ther therapist. She said, I said, I'm preaching Easter Sunday. She said, uh, no, 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 sir. I said, you missed me. I'm preaching Easter Sunday. She said, but Mr. Lewis, I said, you need to understand. I'm preaching Easter Sunday. So they came back at me and said, well, you can't get a pass to travel that far. I said, I'm preaching Easter Sunday. My nurse came in and said, Mr. Lewis, we don't know how you got it, but you got a pass to go home. Easter Sunday morning, they rolled me in church. I couldn't stand up, but guess what I could do? Preach. See, difficulty ought not stop you. You cannot focus on the whole. You got to keep your focus on the donut. Beloved, trouble just shows up. But can I tell you what else adversity does? Adversity allows you to identify who your real friends are. It is true some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not, less, not, less, not sincerely, supposing that he can stir up trouble while I'm in chains. No matter how you read that, this verse sounds strange to our ear. Paul is speaking about two groups of genuine, get this now, he's speaking about two groups of genuine believers. One group loves him and preaches the gospel from a good motive. The other group is either evidently jealous of his leadership and trying to take advantage of the imprisonment. You know, they even had church splits, splits way back then. Preachers didn't know how to support one another. It's important to know that whoever these selfish preachers are, they're not false witnesses. They're not apostate. If they were, Paul could hardly have rejoiced in their preaching. Beloved, just because we don't worship like each other, don't mean we're not saved in the same God. Yo, see, for we have to understand, worship means that we find something worthy in God to be praised. And, and, and here's the thing, you can never worship God past your experience. And, 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 and sometimes you see some folks in church and they wave in their hand and clapping their hand and saying amen, and some folks on the other side of the room looking at them, won't they shut up? <laughs> but here's the problem. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know where God brought me from. You don't know how he kept me. So, so why are you telling me to shut up? I got some bad news for you. I can get even more indignified than this. <laughs> I need you to know where God has brought me from. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power unto salvation. God has brought me. He's kept me. He's delivered me. And so for you to tell me to be quiet, you have lost your mind. 
There's a reason I've been loud. Because God brought me from somewhere. Now, if that's not your experience, I'm not mad at you. Worship where you are. But let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Beloved, you know how much we love and respect our dear brother Paul. No one loves him more than we do. However, it seems as if Paul caused trouble everywhere he goes. I got any troublemakers in here? John Lewis said you ought to get in good trouble. You ought to be able to tell somebody while you're standing in line at Sonic or at Burger King or wherever you're at the pharmacy, how good God's been to you. You ought to cause some problems at the school board meeting because you just want to talk about how good God's been. Last time I checked, maybe I need to check separately because I'm not at home, but I don't believe any of y'all have been stoned lately. <laughs> I don't believe anybody has been, well, maybe. I, I don't believe too many of us have been arrested. Can't say for sure. Some of y'all look a little sus back there, you know, you know, going down the road. But you've not been arrested. You've not been stoned. Nobody's sneaking behind your back talking about you're not who you say you are. But Paul, in the middle of all of that, in the midst of all that, he continued to talk about God both day and night. I, if I could get real honest with you, I don't know if I could have done that. Locked up? In jail? Just think about this. He hadn't had a trial in two years. But he's changed up. But he sees it as an opportunity to spread the gospel. He's been rejected. He's been lied on, he's been buked, he's been scorned, but the preacher in him keeps sharing the good news. If I could be so bold to say, at some point, it had to be extremely embarrassing for this man of God, this preacher, for somebody to say, yeah, you know that preacher that's locked up? The one that has a guard on him 24 hours a day. How in the world can your spiritual leader be in jail? Beloved, we must realize sometimes our spiritual leaders got to get in trouble in order to free us from our dilemmas. Here's what we have to do things. First of all, we got to agree to pray for them. We got to agree to pray for them and we got to ask God for that release. First, we got to agree to pray for them and ask God for their release. But secondly, we must pray like Jesus. Not my will. Thy will be done. God, I want him to be free. But if that's not what you have in plan, fix me to accept your will. God, I, I want to be made different, but if you don't do what I want you to do, fix me that I will accept your will. And then, beloved, we got to sound like we mean it. We actually have to mean the fact, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And one of the hardest things in life is to be in worship with brothers and sisters only to see them fall by the wayside. Brothers and sisters you've labored with and cried with and prayed with only to see them turn to another way. 
you know what I discovered? When they walk out that door, God has somebody else coming through the other. We just got to be prepared to receive them. We can't focus on the hole that left. We got to focus on the donut that came in. Sometimes we can't see God's hand. We just got to trust him. He's moving. And while we're trusting, again, I say rejoice. As I get ready to go to my seat, adversity not only opens a new door for the advancement of the gospel, it not only reveals our real friends, not only does it make us bold in our witness, but beloved, adversity proves our ultimate value. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motive or truth, Christ is priest. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continuously rejoice. Paul comes to a triumphant conclusion. He has chosen to rejoice in spite of his critics. He's chosen to praise God in spite of the backbiters. He's chosen to worship God in spite of the hypocrites. He has made up his mind that the main thing must always remain the main thing. We've got to keep our eyes on the donut and stop focusing in on the home. For Paul, the main thing is the gospel. He refused to be divided by lesser issues, such as how many people felt or how they felt about him. You know, we have more folks arguing at church what we're going to cook on Sunday morning for Sunday evening dinner than we do about the gospel. Okay. Maybe that's only at unity. <laughs> but I heard the preacher get up here and make a little appeal for folks to cook turkey and ham. And some of y'all thought that was funny. Because here's what some of you said, I'm not cooking either one. I wish you would ask me again. The problem is that we get focused in on something that's not important. The main thing must remain the main thing. The main thing in church is that he was born of a virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lived 30 and 3 years, died on an old rugged cross, buried in a borrowed grave, but brought in Sunday morning. He got up and declared that all power. That's the main thing. And if we got something else, then we're in the wrong business. All I know is Jesus and him crucified and resurrected. Now, here's the great thing. He's ascended into heaven, and he's now sit down at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for you and for me. That's the main thing. And Paul is saying, Regardless of why they're doing whatever they're doing, whether it's for filthy lucre, whatever they're doing it for, the main thing is the main thing, is the gospel being preached. No matter what position someone takes on any issue, the main thing must remain the main thing. Brother Andrew, I got bad news for you. You're probably the most criticized and scrutinized person here in Hamilton. Well, there's a couple of other pastors here. I know they love you on Sunday morning, but my pastors used to say, if you really want to know how Grandma feel about you, go over to her house on her birthday. 
Beloved, the church has become the place where either we love each other or we tell each other why we don't. That we can fix whatever the issue might be. The main thing has to be the main thing. But some of us are so busy looking at the whole, we've forgotten God has given us the donut. Here's the thing that I know about your pastor, and I'm closing. He's committed himself to Calvary. Don't touch the person next to you and say, you can say amen, that's true. <laughs> See, next time we co I come, we're going to have an amen cheerleading practice. <laughs> I'm going to have to get y'all to say amen. Y'all sitting here looking at me like I ain't preaching. Somebody say amen. amen. There you go. We gonna get better. So Brother Andrew, at least on Sunday mornings, have at least say five amens before they go home. <laughs> that sounds like a little Catholic to me, but feel me. Beloved, if you are born again, it is natural for you to be under attack. If the enemy is not bothering you, it may mean that he's not bothering you because he's already got you. But when you're going through trial and tribulation, you ought to find a reason to give God glory. You ought to give him praise. Here's my final question for you. Do you believe whatever you're going through, God is able to work it out? Then what's your, where's your praise? Where's your celebration? Where's your thanksgiving? Where is his love endureth forever? That's what we kept reading. Regardless of what I'm going through, God is continuously blessing me. And it must be important because in John's gospel, here's what Jesus says in that fourth chapter of John's gospel. He says that, that God is seeking those that would worship him in spirit and in truth. In, in other words, there are some worshipers that he's not really concerned about. But those of us that will worship him in spirit and truth, he's seeking us. Because God deserves your hallelujah. God deserves your thank you, Jesus. Oh, clap your hands and shout with a loud voice. That's what the psalmist says. For the Lord has been good to us. And even though you got 12 donuts and all of them got holes in it, don't worry about the holes. Focus in on the 12 donuts that you do have and give God praise for right where you are. God is deserving of your praise. No matter what life comes, no matter what shows up, no matter what you're going through, God is bigger than my situation. He's greater than my circumstance. And I owe him a hallelujah. I owe him a thank you, Jesus. I owe him surrender. I owe him, Father, I will stand right here till you bless me. And I'm not going to move, Master, until your will has been made clear to me. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to stay right here till your will has been made clear to me. Focus on the donut and not the hole. Now you know I invited him. <laughs> you know, when, when pastors do pulpit swaps, usually the same Sunday they'll go. But I said, no, because <laughs> I want to be here when he is here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brother Richard, what's your Sunday look like next week? I'm glad you listened to the Lord, brother, and preached what he put on your heart also recognize you handed the invitation over to me and you said that's when they stopped listening so <laughs> we'll keep it uh, brief goodness gracious y'all know I'm pretty laid back but
goodness. That, uh, thank you, brother. We need to desire Christ in the way that Paul desired Christ. And to make Christ our everything in the way that Paul made Christ our everything. If we hope to see our afflictions turn out for our good and most of all for his glory. Um, our brother has challenged us with the word of God. And I can tell you, I know in this room, we need that challenge. It's easy to be cold and it's easy to be calm and it's easy to take for granted what Jesus Christ has done. But let's find confidence in what he's done, boldness in what he's done, and the willingness to tell the, lo the world what our Lord has done for us. We're going to have a time of invitation so that you can respond to God's word. And I'll be down here at the front. Brother Richard will be down here at the front to pray with you, to walk you through whatever needs you might have. But I would guess that most of us, where we are in our pews, simply need to humble ourselves with our God and to seek boldness. You know what Paul asked for when he was in prison? That he might be bold in the sharing of the gospel. Let us be a people so enamored with Jesus that we find boldness to tell the person next to us about our good God and Savior. So stand with me and let's respond to God's word.